Hello everyone. Welcome to the attic of Piedmont Trails. My name is Carol and um hope everyone is having a great weekend so far. Today is August the 29th of 2021 and you are watching the live stream of Piedmont Trails. Um, tonight our segment is all about the Great Wagon Road project and if you're not familiar with this project I urge you all to visit PiedmontTrails.com and click on the Great Wagon Road projects page. I have a separate page on the website dedicated to that project and it goes into detail of what our goals are, how we got started, and what all is, it, what all is involved with the Great Wagon Road. It goes into part of its history and I, there are several articles written about this historic road on the site as well. Lots of references and sources that you may use along the way to identify your family who lived along the Great Wagon Road. The this time period takes place through the 18th century and I, tonight I'm going to reveal um, over 50 names, almost 60, 60 surnames of people who actually lived along the road during this time period. Um, the names will not be in any type of order and in most cases I will share the location and a few more details that I was able to write down in my notes for, before tonight. Tonight's stream, I'm just reminding everyone that this is the last of our shorter segments as we are making the switch to our monthly live streams in the future. And that'll be starting next month in September. And I will have more t details about that towards the end of this live stream session. Um, the live chat is up and loaded. I can see your comments, Rick. Welcome. Um, um, thank you for joining me this evening. I see you, that you are here. And for the rest of you, say hi to me. Let me know what you've got going on in your genealogy world today and tell me where you're from. And let's get started from the attic tonight. By the way, this is where all the action takes place, where all the maps, the research data, material, notes, uh, you name it, all from all kinds of resources comes together in the attic for Piedmont Trail. So, yeah, and we might need to extend the attic some. We'll have to... We'll have to think about that later. <laughs> okay. But tonight I'm going to give you a, um, a short beginning, a little introduction before I get into the surnames. Okay. And for the most part, when I get to the surnames part, I will try to remember to spell some of these um, due to my accent. Okay. <laughs> All right. So documents prove the road's existence through journals and diaries dating to 1743 and even before that. Um, growth continued along the road until primarily around the years of 1756, 57, and 58. And the reason for that was because of the onset of the French and Indian War. Um, during that time, more forts and blockhouses were constructed on the actual road. And many earlier settlements who were there, who were present before, were left abandoned um, as families fled to areas heading further south to avoid attacks and conflicts of war. By 1760, though, the road is very well known. So don't, I don't want you to mistake me here. The road was well known years before, but by 1760, the growth and the familiarity of this road is famous. Everyone knew about it. Everyone knew about this road. Not everyone called it the Great Wagon Road. Some people call it the Great Philadelphia Road, the Carolina Road, it, or the Old Wagon Road leading to the Carolinas. But everyone knew about the existence of this road. So by 1760, the road was well known and was packed with pack horse trains goods wagons, and I'm going to go into detail what I'm talking about here, drovers and migrating families. It's the road has now became the first interstate in our nation's history. And it was during this time period when this happened. But the road overall is in terrible, terrible condition. The most inland western road of the colonies was really given the appearance of a deep, rutted, muddy, rocky mess. It was really a truly mess. And this goes further and it explains the alternate routes as the traffic increased while there were so many alternate routes along the Great Wagon Road. And it, they, they varied from region to region, from season to season. 
originally the drover's destination. These drovers are, drovers are people. These are local families who are driving their herds to market. Their herds could be cattle. They could be uh, pigs or hogs. They could be sheep. But they are driving these herds along the Great Wagon Road to market. They would normally do this once a year. And it would usually be two or three, depending on the size of the herd, two or three herd, uh, drovers driving the herd for a community. And I have found documentation from various families in North Carolina who relied on one or two people in a small community to take their herds, their portion of the herds to market for them. They trusted these individuals to do that. And that's what a drover is. Going back to my um, description of a goods wagons, a goods wagon is described is mainly consisted of a wagon filled with all types of goods that would travel down the great wagon road to the families throughout the frontier and offering them items for sale or trade. And these were common sites along the great wagon road, especially um, during this time period after 1760. Okay, um, so originally the drover's destination was Philadelphia, but as the settlements grew in Virginia and in North Carolina, their destinations changed. They changed to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and to Winchester, Virginia, and to Salisbury, North Carolina, and Camden, South Carolina. These little towns that I'm mentioning became major marketplaces. It was during the 1760 decade that public houses were more numerous along the road. These were stopping points for migrating families to stay overnight, uh, to be protected from weather, um, things of that nature, or possible attacks along the road. Our ancestors experienced these businesses as they tra traveled during this decade and moving forward. Now I'm going to give you an example of some ledgers one person had asked me on Facebook, I had mentioned something about um, a ferry over crossing the Potomac River, River, and they were inquiring, where are their records? Yes, there are records for these. And uh, in some cases, you will find surnames of families using the actual ferries. Now, you'll need to check with them. I can't remember the historical society that actually had the records for the ferry in Williamsport, Maryland. But I'll get that and see if I can't post it on Facebook for that individual. But there are records out there. Okay, uh, six pence. It would cost six pence for lodging. That's with clean sheets and one bed. That's the normal rate during the 1760. Nine pence for a warm meal and, um, and a small amount of beer. Okay, three pence for a man and a horse crossing a ferry. Now, some ferries varied in their prices, but this was average. 18 pence for a coach and a driver, because usually a coach and a driver, that consists of six horses. Um, 12 pence for a cart or a wagon. So if you're researching your families and they have a cart or a wagon, you're looking at an average. They spent 12 pence if they crossed on a ferry. Three pence for every head of cattle. Hogs were considered a quarter of a horse charge. Okay, so that gives you some examples of what some of the prices would be. The Conestoga wagons averaged up to about 3,500 pounds loaded. Um, that's a lot of weight. Some wagons were as large as 26 feet in length and 11 feet in height. They were balanced. They were, um, these were like machines of the day. They were completely balanced. They were arched to transform it into a boat if need be while crossing major rivers. Usually if um, you're wondering, did my ancestor cross here? Did they cross there? Their mark for crossing a river was three foot. That was their usual mark. If it was above three foot, then they more than likely wouldn't have taken a chance. Um, and if it was in heavy rapids or during flooding, then they probably, they wait, they would wait it out and they simply wouldn't cross. A hinged tailgate was located at the rear and feed boxes were attached on the side for the livestock. A lazy board was also added behind the left front wheel, uh, wheel for the driver. 
the houses that you find along the Great Wagon Road during this time period are averaging about 16 by 20 feet. And it would take approximately 50 trees to maybe a, up to 80 trees uh, would be needed to con make this construction happen. And if they had six to eight good people working all day, they could do build a home in approximately a week during good weather. Um, they would create window openings with no glass, but mainly window openings for, to let light in. And mainly shutters and doors used wooden pegs to hold them together. Metal was a rarity during these early years along the Great Wagon Road for these early houses. One thing that I wrote down to remember about the early roads, when you run across road petitions, petitions presented to local courts preserve the location and documents the needs of the public at that time. However, and I stress this, however, courts don't necessarily proclaim the origins of early roads. And this is the primary case with the Great Wagon Road. A people's route to new beginnings along the frontier spanning the history of nearly 280 years. It's amazing. It's this 280 years of history that moves the Great Wagon Road project forward. And personally, I will not stop until the sounds of the road, the voices of the traveling families, and the dreams of a better life are preserved for the future generations to come. And that's a promise. I won't, I won't stop. Okay, we're going on to the surnames. Okay, the first guy, gentleman here that I'm going to mention, and like I said, these are not in any order at all, none whatsoever, and these are not the only surnames that I have in my files pertaining to the Great Wagon Road by any means. This is just a random uh, group that I pulled together for tonight's segment. But this gentleman that I'm going to mention, I feel that at times the true history of his association with the Great Wagon Road is, is overlooked. So I'm going to bring him up first for that reason. And his name is John Armstrong. He is better known as Captain Jack Armstrong. If you've heard of him, then I'm going to clap. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. He is a very well-known trader along the Warrior's Path, which was known um, as the Great Wagon Road. And he was murdered along the Great Wagon Road as well. There's a section of the road that is named Jack Narrows, which is named in his honor. This is where supposedly the actual um, crime took place during for his murder. Um, you can read about him online. And it, there are several good articles that I found today while I was just skimming through getting ready for tonight's segment that went into detail about his early life and some of the events that led up to his death. But he was very, very familiar with the Great Wagon Road. He was a um, tradesman. He um, knew the local Native Americans very extremely well. If you study the history, you'll see what I mean with that. And he was also very well known, um, very well known. But Jack Narrows, the location that I mentioned, is located near Mount Union, Pennsylvania. That's Mount Union, Pennsylvania. Okay. All right. The next short, uh, surname I'm mentioning is Smith. That's S-C-H-M-I-D-T. And first name is Stephen. He lived along the route in present day Winchester, Virginia. This was not far from the Hoist Height Inn. And we need to add Hoist Height. So there's my 60 names for tonight. I was at 59. So he'll be my 60. And that last name is H-I-T-E. If you've never heard of Hoist Height along the Great Wagon Road, I urge you to type it in online because you will see a fascinating history with Mr. Height. Next surname is Kerfer, and I'm going to spell it. And it could be Kufer is the way they may have pronounced it then. But it's K-U-E-F-E-R, first name Christopher. He actually operated an inn near the Rappahannock River. Okay? In Virginia. Next surname is Craig, C R A I G, first name John. This is a Presbyterian minister. He lived near present day Stanton and Tickling Spring, um, which is pretty near Lexington, Virginia today. Okay. Next one is Ingalls, I N G L E S, first name William. Um, if you've never, William Ingalls is pretty famous to me on the Great Wagon Road. He was a ferryman. He operated a ferry not too far from 
Roanoke, which they called the Big Lick back then in Virginia. Okay, the next one is Beard, B-E-A-R-D, first name John Lewis, John Lewis Beard. He owned a tavern near Salisbury, North Carolina. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, I think he was the one of the first ones who built, who constructed and established a tavern in Salisbury, North Carolina, right on the Great Wagon Road. Next uh, surname is Hughes, H-U-G-H-E-S, first name Hudson. He also owned and operated a business in Salisbury, North Carolina, and it was an inn. He operated an inn. Uh, next surname is Gillespie, G-I-L-L-E-S-P-I-E, -E, first name Thomas. He operated a tavern in, in and around near Salisbury, right on the Great Wagon Road. Next surname is Mitchell, M-I-T-C-H-E-L-L, -L, first name John. He operated a store. It was called a goods store. Um, and he was right inside of Salisbury, North Carolina, right on the road. Next um, gentleman's name is Nesbitt, N-E-S-B-I-T, first name is William, operated a store in Salisbury, North Carolina. Okay, now I'm going to move on to Montgomery, M-O-N-T-G-O-M-E-R-Y, first name William, was living in Augusta County, Virginia, uh, right on the road. Craig, but some of these surnames that I'm getting ready to mention here in this next little segment, they lived in Augusta County, Virginia for a short time, and then they moved into North Carolina. Craig, C-R-A-I-G-E, first name Alexander. Next surname is Bashford, B-A-S-H-F-O-R-D, Thomas, Thomas Bashford. Next surname is Bowers, B-O-W-E-R-S, first name James. Next surname is Beryl, B-E-R-R-E-L-L, -E -R -R -E -L -L, first name John. Next surname is Dean, D-E-A-N, and first name is Luke. Luke Dean settled in Virginia for a short period of time, and then he moved into present-day Rowan County, but then he later moved over to um, Guilford County, North Carolina. I'm just, uh, and some of these uh, things will just randomly hit me, and if they do with the details, and I'll, I'll share them with you guys, but that, that just hit me with Luke Dean. Okay, with uh, next surname is Barry, B-E-R-R-Y, first name James, and next surname is Hora, and that's H-O-R-A-H, first name Henry. This next surname, I'm going to try my best, is Fawnenstock. Fawnenstock is F-A-H-N-E-S-T-O-C-K, first name Casper. He all owned and operated the famous Dutch Tavern. If you've not heard of that, Look it up. Uh, located in Pennsylvania. Haymaker, H-A-Y-M-A-K-E-R, first name Adam. He was a very well-known gunsmith who lived in Winchester, uh, Virginia. Very well-known. Um, if you've heard relations to the squirrel gun, uh, this goes back to Mr. Haymaker and his business in that area. Next surname is Van Meter, B-A-N-M-E-T-E-R. These were two brothers, Isaac and John. Um, they lived close to Mr. Hoist Height in Winchester, Virginia, right on the wagon road. Next surname is Lilburn, L-I-L-B-U-R-N, first name John. Lived near Opricon Creek, right on the road. Next surname is Kersey. That's K-E-R-S-E-Y. First name is John. Mr. Kersey lived a very interesting life. He operated a ferry along the Shenandoah River um, as early as 1743. Um, only I found the actual petition for that ferry. So it was an amazing find. I remember the day I found that. Okay, now these... Next, I'm going to name three surnames here, and they lived along the road at the Ashby Settlement, and that's A-S-H-B-Y Settlement, and the Ashby Settlement holds a long history along the Great Wagon Road, and first surname is Hardin, H-A-R-D-I-N, James, first name, James Hardin. Next surname is Timmons, T-I-M-M-O-N-S, first name Samuel. Next surname is Rogers, R-O-G-E-R-S, 
first name Edward. And those three are from the have been established as living along the Great Wagon Road in the Ashby settlement. Okay, this next surname lived in the Chapel settlement. And these are very early settlements, okay? Or, um, surname is Evans, E-V-A-N-S, um, first name John. The Patterson family is a huge family that is living right on the Great Wagon Road as well. And they're residing on the road right at Patterson's Creek. They hold a very historical and fascinating history. Um, and like I said, they are a huge family. So I left it as the Patterson family. <laughs> All right. The next surname is Froman, F-R-O-M-A-N, first name Peter. This young gentleman was related to John Hyatt by marriage. Um, he married his daughter. He settled along um, Cedar Creek, and he constructed a block house, and he enclosed two acres of land and, put, and constructed a fort around these two acres with the block house inside. Um, this was done for protection around the Cedar Creek area. Um, this would have been near, not far from the Natural Bridge of Virginia. They, the family owned the property uh, for quite some time, for, for a couple of two generations, that I, if I can remember right. And then they left, the, that second generation left it to some close friends, not necessarily relatives. But then later, the property later fell into the hands of the Moss family, and that's M-O-S-S. -S. And you can find a lot of information about the, um, the original home, where it was located, where the fort was located. It's a very historical area around Cedar Creek. Okay, the next surname is Cartmel, C-A-R-T-M-E-L-L. -L. First name is John. He was a neighbor to Peter Froman who lived right on the Great Wagon Road. Another neighbor who lived right near Cartmel was Laughlin, L-O-F-L-A-N-D, first name David. The Harrison family um, originally settled in Augusta County, Virginia, which is now present day Rockingham County. And um, a lot of the, they, a great portion of this family also migrated into North Carolina and South Carolina. Okay, the next surname is Hickey, H-I-C-K-E-Y, first name John. Mr. John Hickey holds a very interesting story, and I need to, I need to share his very interesting story on Piedmont Trails. He operated a store, a tavern, and an inn right near the North Carolina-Virginia border, not far from present-day Mayo River, um, right near Bassett, Virginia, and he left some very intriguing records behind and I knew he associated with a lot of people in that area. Um, his time period is around 1755 through 1765 early onset of 1770 um, is where his records date. And there are many, many surnames who uh, families who were living in that area that he associated with and he kept records of fascinating to go through them. Okay, the next surname is Brian, B-R-Y-A-N. Some people refer to him as Bryant, B-R-Y-A-N-T, and first name Morgan. Um, he lived along the Yakin River in North Carolina. Um, next surname is Hughes, H-U-G-H-E-S, first name Edward. He also lived along the Yakin River, just north of Morgan Bryan. And the next surname is Linville, L-I-N-V-I-L-L-E, uh, first name William. He was also a neighbor to Mr. Edward Hughes on the Yakin River in North Carolina. The next surname is Boone, uh, B-O-O-N-E, and first name is Squire. This is the uh, famous father of Daniel Boone who lived along the Yakin River as well. Next surname is Cloyd, C-L-O-Y-D, first name David. He lived in Fincastle, Virginia, right along the Great Wagon Road. The Hairston family, H-A-I-R-S-T-O-N. The Hairston family moved and migrated into North Carolina and settled along the Dan River. And parts of their property were are located along the Great Wagon Road in that area. Next surname is Hal, H-O-W-E-L-L. -L. First name is Samuel. 
Mr. Howe operated a tavern in uh, Chester County, Pennsylvania. A very active tavern in Pennsylvania. <laughs> okay, um, Hunt, H-U-N-T, um, first name is Jonathan. Mr. Jonathan Hunt operated a mill along Abbott's Creek, um, which was actually a shootout from the Great Wagon Road, but a very, very short shootout away from the Great Wagon Road. Another uh, person of interest along that, in that same area, who did operate a mill as well is Teague, T-E-A-G-U-E, -E, first name Moses. Another interesting tavern, if you want to look up tavern history along the Great Wagon Road, look up the Black Horse Tavern of Virginia. And I promise you, you won't be disappointed. Okay, next surname is Jones, J-O-N-E-S, first name Gabriel. Gabriel Jones is a, he's an attorney, he's a lawyer, and he's living right on the road. He acquires quite a deal of property, and he represents a huge amount of um, families who are in need of legal services during this time period in Rockingham County vicinity of Virginia. He was very, very well known. Um, next surname is McAnally, first name Charles, and I'm going to mention this next surname with him, and that's Davis, D-A-V-I-S, first name William. These two gentlemen both lived at the Dan River Crossing along the Great Wagon Road. They were, I would have to say, uh, from conducting research with these two gentlemen, they were in business together for a short period of time, and um, they were wheelwrights, they dealt with trade, which you will find this along on a lot of the water crossings along the Great Wagon Road. You'll see these little businesses um, spring up there where families are trying to survive and they'll also trying to help other families as they migrate through the area. Okay, now the next segment that I'm going to uh, of these surnames are from Augusta County, Virginia in that area. And these date from 1751, 52 to 1760. First surname is Ewing, E-W-I-N-G, first name Charles. Surname Lewis, L-E-W-I-S, first name Thomas. Surname Mayer, M-A-Y-E-R, first name Jacob. Surname Thompson, T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N, first name John. Surname Watkins, W-A-T-K-I-N-S, uh, first name Benjamin. And surname Stemmer, S-T-E-M-M-E-R, first name Martin. Okay. All right. Next surname is Nixon, N-I-X-E-N, first name Henry. Mr. Henry Nixon owned 993 acres near Conway's Branch in Virginia, during the year of 1739. Now, when I first started this segment, I told you that documents prove the road from journals and diaries and other materials dating from 1743, and then I said, and before. These are one of the prime examples of a, cust of, uh, a settler who settled along the Great Wagon Road and documents it as the old wagon, as the wagon road in 1739 in Virginia. Okay, next surname is Worthington, W-O-R-T-H-I-N-G-T-O-N, first name Robert. And another Worthington, I'm not sure if this was a brother or an uncle, but um, his first name is Samuel. They are living in Frederick County, Virginia. Both of the deed state living along the Great Wagon Road, and they are both dated for the year 1751. Next surname is Paxton, P-A-X-T-O-N, first name Reuben. He owned 400 acres adjoining lands of Isaac Julian and John Petit. And his deed dates to 1760 in Virginia. Next surname is Hall, first H-A-L-L, -L, and first name is John. This is located in Lewinburg County, Virginia. The deed dates to 1754. It states on the road, on the actual road of 750 acres. Okay. Macken Allen is, um, the next surname is M-A-C-K-A-L-L-A-N, first name John, Bedford County, Virginia, 
400 acres along the road dates to 1755. Next surname is Connett, C-O-N-N-A-N-T, first name Charles. Um, Mr. Charles Connett, uh, he is living in Maryland during 1746-47. The actual deed is dated 1747, but the deed... Um, it goes into detail where he is actually living. He's living near a Mark Job's fishing house and the road, with the road passing through Charles Connett's property. It's noted on his survey. The petition for the establishment of Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, is dated February 6, 1728. And it contains many surnames of families who later, years later, migrated along the Great Wagon Road. If you, you can actually look at this petition online. Um, go to the Pennsylvania State Archives and just enter in petition for the establishment of Lancaster County, 1728. Um, and it will show you, it will list to you all of those surnames. And you'll, it, once you start researching, you may find one of your family's ancestor surnames there amongst the list. But a great many of these surnames ended up leaving some 20, 30 years later from this area. Okay. So there's the surnames. If you have any information regarding the Great Wagon Road, you can contact the Great Wagon Road Project through the Piedmont Trails uh, website at PiedmontTrails.com. Just click on the Great Wagon Road Projects page and then click on the contact link. Um, please be sure to subscribe to Piedmont Trails. It's, it's free to do that. And you, by subscribing, you will see firsthand information of any updates from Piedmont Trails about the Great Wagon Road. Okay. All right. I was just looking at my chat to make sure that... Um, there was no comments or anything, no questions, and that's good. Okay. So, like I said earlier, the next live stream will be held September 26th at 7.30 p.m. And I will create an event on Facebook to notify everyone. The next event will discuss more in detail about the route, the actual route of the Great Wagon Road. And I'll go into more detail about the research material, the proof of the road and what I have found so far and what the project has found. I will be sharing more detail about my personal techniques that I use for the 18th century era. I find this every day for many people. This, for, this is a very difficult period to research, but for me, it's my favorite. And it has been my favorite timelines for many, many years. So on the next live stream, be prepared for that stream to last about 40 minutes to an hour presentation. Bring your friends. Um, we hold these live streams on uh, streams on a public platform on YouTube so anyone can watch them. You don't have to be a su subscriber of Piedmont Trails to, to join in on the live stream. Okay. All right. So I want to share my book find for the week. And this one's kind of fun. Oh, Rick, thank you, Rick, for saying awesome. I really appreciate that. Um, this book just was just recently released, and I happened to get an early copy of it. I think you can now, after a few days after I got mine, I got it autographed too, which is really cool. But um, now you can, put, you can purchase it online, and you can go to the Kernisville Historical Museum in North Carolina and purchase this book from their website. And it is entitled Haunted Kernersville. Um, the, the reason why I get these types of books, as I stated earlier, I'm not going to go into, de into conversation about do I believe in ghosts and all this stuff. I know what I am really, really after with books like this is the family stories and the actual families who lived in that area. And um, I've I've already read this book. Most of these pictures, I, I'm, I'm very familiar with this area. As I had family members there for many, many years, place where I grew up. And so I'm very familiar. And as I went through all these stories, I knew every single family in here. And I'd already heard of the stories as well. But it's always good to have it in printed form and, and a keepsake and with a good autograph too. But 
as I was telling a friend a couple of weeks ago that I was uh, sharing with you all about a volume set of ghost stories that was printed for the area of Virginia and it was a four volume set and it went from stories dated back to the uh, late 17th century and these stories are passed on from generation to generation and they can hold a lot of clues and hints about families and are in entice us to move forward with our family research so that's what really gets me into getting in books like this because it's the family stories and it's the people it's their stories is what i'm after and their clues and hints that they can offer me so that's that's why i do that okay i'm going to end it here uh be sure to join me on september 26 at 7 30 right here on the piedmont trails youtube channel and until then enjoy your journey to the past and god bless <music>